Hello, and welcome to this installment of our PCORI hosted webinar series, Confronting COVID-19, Finding Hospital Capacity and Improving Patient Flow. This session focuses on how hospitals can carry out urgent surgeries, such as for cancer and transplants amid the pandemic, and how to begin planning for recovery of all surgical services, including elective surgery. In the coming weeks, we'll address other issues, including how hospitals and health systems manage nurse staffing as we try to bring you the latest and promising practices and evidence as these are evolving amid the pandemic. Before I introduce today's speakers, let me orient you again to aspects of this webinar platform and to our process today. On the slide that you see in front of you now is a screenshot of the attendee interface. You should also be seeing something that looks exactly like that on your own computer desktop in the upper right hand corner. Right now, by default, you're listening through your computer speaker system, but if you would prefer to listen over the phone instead, just select phone call in the audio pane, and the dial-in information will be displayed so you can call in separately on your phone. Please note that this webinar is being recorded for posting on PCORI's website, and that recording will be available to the public after this event. We'll also be taking questions for our speakers directly on this webinar. So please type those into the questions pane of the control panel. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and we're gonna to try to answer as many as we can. So now we'll, we turn to our topic of carrying out uh, urgent surgeries during the pandemic. And as we know, many hospitals and health systems have had to either eliminate or cut back sharply on the number of elective surgeries and even some urgent surgeries. They've taken these steps for many reasons. When they were told to do that by CMS and others, they've also done this to conserve personal protective equipment or PPE during the pandemic, as well as to create capacity to deal with COVID-19 patients. At the same time though, thousands of patients still need surgery for conditions such as cancer or organ transplants. The early evidence in from Wuhan, China indicates a need to move really carefully here because many surgical patients there who became infected with the virus during or after surgery had very high mortality and morbidity. Now at the same time, according to information gathered by the Healthcare Financial Management Association, across the US now, inpatient surgical volumes are down 30 to 50%. Outpatient surgical volumes and procedures are down 50% or more, and ambulatory surgery center procedures are down 70% or more. That's turning into a total 40 to 60% loss of revenues among the nation's hospitals. So all of these factors, the need for surgery, the financial impact, et cetera, have to be balanced now as institutions determine what urgent surgeries have to be performed now, how and when to do that, and how to recover over time to a full load of elective and urgent surgeries as events uh, indicate will be possible. So our speakers today are going to discuss how their North American institutions are balancing all these considerations amid the pandemic, prioritizing the surgeries they can carry out, and contemplating recovery when the dimension of the pandemic does allow. Our speakers today are first Dr. Shaf Keshavji, who is Surgeon-in-Chief of Sprott Surgery at University Health Network in Toronto, Canada. He's also a professor of thoracic surgery and a lung transplant specialist at the University of Toronto. University Health Network encompasses 1,300 beds in four major hospitals in Toronto, along with two ter tertiary, excuse me, academic hospitals, a cancer center, a rehabilitation institute, as well as the Michener Institute of Education. It conducts the largest hospital-based research program in Canada, typically ranks number one or number two annually in terms of the total volume of transplants performed among centers in North America. We're also joined by Schaff's colleague, Dr. Tom Waddell, who's chair of the Division of Thoracic Surgery at the University of Toronto, and also the Surgery Pandemic Planning Lead for University Health Network. We're very happy to be joined by Dr. Bruce Gewertz, who's Surgeon in Chief, Chair of the Department of Surgery and Vice Dean for Academic Affairs at Cedar sinai Health System in California. Cedar sinai is a nonprofit academic healthcare organization serving more than 1 million people annually 
in more than 40 locations in Los Angeles and beyond. In normal times, Cedars conducts about 120 surgeries daily, including for heart transplants, cancers, and other urgent surgeries. And finally, we're also very happy to have with us two distinguished discussants. First, Dr. David Hoyt, who's the Executive Director of the American College of Surgeons. That's the scientific and educational organization founded to raise the standards of surgical practice and to improve the quality of care for surgical patients. We're also joined by Eugene Litvak, who's President, CEO, and Founder of the Institute for Healthcare Optimization. That's a nonprofit organization that catalyzes and spreads improvements in operations management and patient flow across the healthcare delivery system. Uh, Eugene is also an adjunct professor in operations management in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. He has also been advising University Health Network on its surgical operations flow. So welcome to all of you. I'd like to begin with having our speakers set some brief context about the situations in which their organizations are operating at the moment. And as we know, good news is that there does appear to be some plateauing of COVID cases around the country and around North America. But let's talk about that. Shaf, give us a thumbnail description of the COVID-19 situation in Toronto and the volume of surgeries you're carrying out there. So um, thank you, Susan. As, as we um, indicated, uh, UHN performs about 25,000 operations a year in surgery alone. And uh, as we uh, saw the pandemic unfold around the world and particularly on the West Coast of North America and then in New York, uh, we started preparing early uh, to, to uh, be ready for it. Um, we currently have uh, 59 uh, patients in, in hospital at UHN with COVID. 23 of them are in the ICU and six of them are on ECMO. It's a slightly higher ratio of ECMO than you'd see in other places, but we are a regional ECMO center for the province. And so we've had COVID patients transferred from ICU to our ICU uh, to manage them on ECMO. And we have a capability of 25 uh, simultaneous ECMOs should we need it, hopefully not. Great, and those uh, numbers are what relative to what they've been in recent weeks, would you say, Shaf? Well, we, we started out fairly slowly with two to five cases, then 10. And then in the last week, uh, uh, we've sort of gone from 20 to, to this uh, 59. So uh, that obviously is, is concerning uh, in terms of the pace of things. Okay, so no, no de declaration as yet of a plateau uh, in Toronto, it would appear. So let's go to Cedar sinai and you, Bruce Gewertz, what's the situation there? Well, we started seeing our first cases, I think, earlier than Toronto. Uh, we currently uh, are uh, experiencing uh, sort of a plateau and almost a slight decrease. We have 130 or so patients in the hospital, of which 90 are confirmed uh, to have the uh, virus. Uh, 45 of them are on ventilators in our intensive care units. Uh, but interestingly, the peak of ventilating support was uh, April 7th, where we had 60 patients uh, on ventilators. So there's no question that either we're learning to be somewhat uh, more circumspect about putting people on ventilators or uh, have a, a, a slight diminishment in the number of people that need that kind of support. Relative uh, to our operating, uh, we normally operate, uh, we do about 120 surgical procedures a day. We are now down to about 40 a day. Uh, obviously, urgent cardiovascular and neurosurgical procedures, uh, cancer procedures that are deemed uh, not able to be postponed even for a month, and uh, a diminished number, but still uh, some transplants, particularly in patients with liver failure and heart transplants in failing uh, hearts. One thing that I learned uh, is that you can't postpone pregnancy and delivery. So we continue to do a very large number of community-based uh, patients who come in for delivery. And we do about 7,000 deliveries a year. So uh, that has been an area that we've been very focused on testing 
Uh, and we've been pleased to note that a very, very few, approaching zero, of our pregnant uh, patients who come into the liver are COVID positive. Good. You've been very fortunate in that respect. Well, as, uh, I'm, uh, so, sorry, go ahead, Bruce. Did you want to add no, something? To I, I was just agreeing. Okay, great. Well, as we know, and as I said earlier, uh, we know recommendations were made at a number of levels to hospitals and health systems in both the US and Canada to curb or eliminate elective surgeries. And in addition, we had a number of surgical specialty societies release consensus statements about undertaking priority urgent surgeries. Tom, both Canada and the province of Ontario have had systems in place that allow priority setting like this, not just in the time of pandemic, but in general. So set that context for us, if you would. So um, you're, you're right, Susan. Thank you for including us in this uh, uh, webinar. Um, in Canada, the, the federal government has a smaller role. The provinces, much like the states, are, are primarily responsible for delivery. And so each province has different systems, but they, they do generally have lots of similarities. <clears throat> We've developed systems that allow us to track patients waiting for surgery. As, as you know, it's a very um, a hot topic or, or t sensitive touch point in Canada about the issue about uh, patients waiting. And so the governments are very sensitive uh, to that issue. And so they've uh, set uh, targets for, you know, what might be a medically appropriate um, duration to wait for an operation. For example, a lobectomy for lung cancer, the target date would be three or four weeks. And so we've had these systems in place to track the um, patients waiting for surgery around the province for over a decade. And uh, inside of the hospital, we've actually now uh, working with IHO and for other reasons developed systems that we call the surgical weight information management system that allows us to see <clears throat> uh, at any given day patients waiting in the queue by priority. And working with the IHO, I mentioned the Institute for Healthcare Optimization, we did a deep dive into our emergency um, work and we uh, broke out our uh, patients needing emergency surgery into eight different levels or categories. And similarly for scheduled surgery, we have systems for cancer that we call priority one, two, and three, and so on. And this allows us to really understand where the patients who most urgently need our care is. As you mentioned, a variety of um, societies have developed lists of procedures or lists of diagnoses or patients who are more urgent than others. But because this is organized uh, provincially, what it means is that there's an ability to compare, for example, a urology patient to a thoracic surgery patient, which isn't really done uh, within the subspecialty organizations. Maybe David will comment on the work that the American College has done to try and do something similar. So I think efforts are underway in the United States to develop similar types of systems, but uh, fortunately in, in Canada and at UHN in particular, we have a pretty good handle on those systems. And just to build on that, uh, Shop, I want to bring you in on this too, but we know that, uh, as Tom was saying, in working with the Institute for Healthcare Optimization, you came up with this way to categorize urgent surgeries, a scale of one to eight, one had to be performed in under 45 minutes. Number eight had to be performed in fewer than 14 days. And you actually have had a, a, a electronic tracking tool and visualization tool that sits on top of the electronic health record to monitor all this. Uh, is the, a, is that correct? And B, is that helping you now keep track of what, uh, what, what surgery is now being put on hold? So that's correct, Susan. So uh, as Tom indicated, at the provincial level, we had performance metrics that would tell us that we're getting a case done in the recommended amount of time, like a lung cancer should be operated on within 28 days and so on. And, and the P1, P4 uh, priority level that is set by Cancer Care Ontario. 
with the with the Institute for Healthcare Optimization, what we did was focused on the urgent cases that range from 45 minutes to 14 days, but also each division head and each surgeon in the divisions participated in categorizing cases into that urgent list. So it wasn't something imposed on them, but which the specialists felt were uh, different levels of urgency and of course adjudicated by the group to, that it all made sense. So when we then went to the step that we now have to cut back surgical services because of uh, COVID coming, the hospital was expanding our critical care capacity from 90 beds to 190 ICU beds and also increasing other medical and surgical beds as well uh, to, to take on this uh, capacity. So the first step that we took in about mid-March was to decrease the number of hours, surgical hours to 50%. And because of the data that we had, Tom was able to calculate and reassure surgeons that in that 50%, of course, all emergencies would be taken care of, but also all of the urgent cancers up to the P3 level would be done in, in that 50%. So in within 48 hours, we cut back all of the non-urgent surgery and focused on the relatively urgent, if you will, and, and emergencies. And then a few days later, as, as things became imminently more of a challenge, we actually cut back to uh, what we call our 14-day rule. You only operate on a patient that would be harmed if they didn't get their operation within 14 days. And again, with, with the classification system from IHO, that means all level one to eight, we have a category system and, and those will get done. And, and anything else that's urgent in the above that could be, that could be justified could also uh, get done in the 14 day rule. I think this was really important because in, in the time of insecurity, when we didn't know what's going to hit us and how hard, it allowed us to get our system prepared uh, to learn how best to use and conserve PPE, to wait for our PPE stocks to be built up, to increase social distancing, physical distancing, like everybody in society should have been doing and should be doing, and to lower the infection spread within the hospital and also prepare the hospital. We moved entire wards around to create COVID negative, PUI, person under investigation, and COVID negative, uh, positive wards, and also, as I mentioned, expanded ICU capability. So it was because we had systematically collected data on surgeries and priorities, and through the work of IHO, where we created a system to move the uh, emergent surgeries out of the pathway of, of scheduled surgeries, uh, we were able to very, in a very data-driven way, step down our uh, activity. In the current state now, we're, we're, only, we're still in the 14-day rule. And as the provincial data is starting to look like it's plateauing, we're doing our work to say, well, how uh, would we open uh, and, and at what level and rate? And it's important to know that right now, no surgeon has their usual elective blocks uh, or OR days. If, you're, if your case fits under the 14-day rule, you submit it to the OR and they'll schedule so you can get your case done. Great. Well, that's a really helpful explanation of what you've done, Shaf and Tom. So let's go to Bruce Gewertz now at Cedar sinai again. Bruce, as you said, Cedars normally does 120 operations per day. Uh, does a great deal of urgent surgery, in particular heart transplants. How did you decide what surgeries got done in this environment and, and set the priorities accordingly? Well, we did have an all hands uh, meeting of the surgical leadership uh, accompanied by our colleagues in anesthesia. And we reached a general consensus on the cases that needed to be done urgently. Uh, at first, to be quite frank, it, it it wasn't so difficult. We anticipated that uh, the uh, emergency period would last three or four weeks. We utilized the thoughtful recommendations from uh, subspecialty groups, the Society for Surgical Oncology, 
the ACS and other organizations. And uh, we brought in our surgical oncologists, our transplant physicians uh, for every discipline and uh, basically worked through the cases uh, on a week by week basis that were scheduled and uh, were able to prioritize, I think in that first wave uh, fairly well. And we went dramatically uh, down to uh, 30 or so cases a day, uh, which gradually increased just slightly to a baseline of about 40 uh, cases a day. Uh, this was uh, generally accepted uh, by both patients and physicians. Patients were not uh, particularly engaged in coming in for anything other than uh, exceptionally uh, life prolonging or uh, suffering reducing uh, surgery. Having said that, as time has gone on, some of the postponements of the cancer cases and alternative therapies that were able to be offered to these cases uh, have, have already been uh, given. And the urgency to do these cases as this uh, uh, setting uh, continues uh, is, is much greater. So it's forced us to take a much more granular uh, look at every and uh, we've noticed that although guidelines are useful, uh, you just can't go by the staged procedure uh, and you have to actually uh, look at the uh, details of the case in order to properly adjudicate it. So we've uh, basically uh, divided cases into uh, what we consider, uh, for lack of a better, more imaginative term, type A, that are patients that are inpatient uh, that will require intubation, or type B, patients that could be done as outpatients or 23-hour stays uh, and that are unlikely to be intubated. We feel that those two uh, general categories uh, change both the resource allocations and the risks to uh, healthcare providers, and uh, we're trying to uh, balance those cases against the uh, requirements for urgent surgery. The advantage that we have, much like Shav described, is that most of our surgeons aren't doing too many office hours, so they are very available to operate under uh, whatever circumstances there are. There certainly is no more block time uh, allocated, and uh, we are uh, now just coming out of this emergency phase. So bottom line, Bruce, do you think your system has allowed you to address the most urgent surgeries in a timely way? And uh, what, what challenges have you encountered in, in doing that? Well, <clears throat> well, I would say so. Uh, I have not received uh, severe uh, feedback that, that what really needs to be done isn't getting done. We have a process by which if a surgeon uh, uh, feels that a patient uh, has been inadvertently excluded from uh, surgery, that they can appeal through their uh, chair uh, to uh, our executive committee. And we've been increasingly open uh, to those appeals. And I sort of feel based uh, on uh, weeks of experience now that our surgeons are behaving in a exceptionally forthright and uh, selfless way. And I have seen very little trying to game that system. In terms of uh, some of the challenges you've encountered, there has been an issue around uh, testing of patients for COVID and where those patients can be placed in the hospital. Tell us about that. Yes, well, like Toronto, we've divided our hospital into COVID and non-COVID areas. And uh, we also have uh, utilized some of our uh, recovery rooms as potential ICUs, although we have not had to actually move patients in there yet. Uh, so uh, testing is, is critically important. And like many places, uh, the Los Angeles area was uh, uh, behind on the availability of testing. And uh, even bigger concern now that the availability has been better has been the accuracy of testing. We've all heard anecdotes of people and patients who have been tested negative and then subsequently tested positive without any repeat exposure. So uh, that is a real concern because it greatly elevates the risk to our uh, providers and it requires uh, accentuated use of the PPE. 
so you so you're getting enough false negatives in the tests that uh, that it's causing that concern. Well, the you know and it's hard to quantitate what enough is, but but certainly uh, we we have generally believed that if a patient tests negative that uh, and they remain isolated, uh, that they are quote safe for surgery. Uh, however, we have had a few instances, uh, not necessarily in surgical patients, but in other patients in which they tested negative and subsequently tested positive. Great. Well, let's, let's move to the question of recovery, of uh, moving back toward what looks more like normal times in terms of volumes of surgeries. And Bruce, let's stay with you for a moment. What is your plan now to begin to eliminate the backlog of surgeries and move back to something closer to normal levels? Well, as we do that, uh, we we certainly feel like uh, the the targets are people with malignancies and unstable uh, other conditions, and those that require treatment. We have uh, three basic principles of evaluating. Number one, they need to have a test that's negative uh, within 48 hours of. We need to have the resources to care for them, whether it's a projected ICU bed or hospital bed, which we have currently not a problem in, in getting. And most importantly, we have to carefully monitor these metrics on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as projected, uh, such that we cannot get too far ahead of ourselves in uh, uh, beginning to uh, liberalize our criteria for patients being operated on. So those three principles uh, will guide us. And uh, over the next week or so, we expect to be somewhat liberalizing our decisions for surgery. There are certainly other areas that uh, are more problematic, uh, things such as joint replacements, as the most obvious example, uh, seem uh, not uh, well-suited uh, for uh, surgical treatment at this time. Not only do we have the resource concerns, but the rehabilitation of these patients is going to be problematic uh, given the social isolation. And uh, we also anticipate that there will be many patients uh, that uh, don't wish to come to the hospital and have a procedure done. So we're going to find out uh, what the, uh, the landscape is as we start to uh, somewhat liberalize our uh, decision making in terms of uh, allowing operations to go forward. Tom, let's go to you. In the case of the University Health Network, what do you think your plan is going to be now to uh, re for recovery and getting back up closer to a normal surgical rate? Well, first of all, I, I very much agree with the principles that Bruce has outlined. And the other concept that he mentioned is that we don't really know what patients will accept. Uh, so it's a bit uh, theoretical at this point. But because we have data about uh, how many cases were performed last year in a particular priority category, we can establish what the missing number is. And because we actually have specific uh, patient lists uh, in the queue, we can uh, you know, rank order those lists in various uh, priority categories and begin to project out and uh, start to do calculations. For example, if we decided that we wanted to bring all of the P3 backlog uh, uh, back to the normal sort of, you know, 20 patients so waiting just from a, a flow through point of view, and we could uh, establish a run rate, let's say over two months to get rid of that backlog, and that would determine how much of our OR resource uh, could be used. Most of our surgery is, is P4, as, as uh, Bruce was mentioning, hip and knee replacements, some things where you really might wonder if the patients uh, would prefer to just wait it out for a little bit longer. So certainly there will be a, um, an ability to differentially tackle these various uh, waiting backlogs uh, using the system resources. One challenge I would say to face is that it's unclear what the um, choke point would be at any given time. It, at one point, it may be ICU beds. At the next point, it may be 
inpatient beds the next day it may be drug shortages and this may evolve and i think we have to um be mindful of that one of the concepts that we're toying with now is that even though the medical urgency of some let's say thyroid uh, surgery may be relatively low and they wouldn't necessarily be um, top of the list from a medical urgency point of view it may be possible to clear that backlog um, with minimal impact on inpatient beds of essentially no impact on ICU beds and so having these different categories and understanding where your most sensitive um, issues in the hospital um, choke points are, I think, will be very helpful. Absolutely. What one other option you have, of course, uh, that some of your work with the Institute for Healthcare uh, Optimization has established is you could increase the uh, the flow of surgeries, if you will, you could move from up to six day a week performance of surgeries as well, or more hours of surgeries on a given day. Do you think you will be in a position to do that? Yeah, certainly the, you know, the um, lessons that we've learned from uh, Dr. Litvak and his team is really that um, to make a system run efficiently, means to be as smooth as possible and to try and eliminate the variability. To some extent, we're kind of at the mercy of the virus and the mercy of our PPE supply chain that may be uh, adding extra variables to the natural variation. But I think the principle of trying to uh, plan ahead for, let's say, you know, the week after next, three weeks from now, four weeks from now, and whatever we do, try to regulate the inflow of patients in a very, very smooth way so that it doesn't add additional complexities to the nurse manager who the next day have to manage a ward of you know, 25 patients and then the following day it's 35 patients and they don't have enough nurses and so on. So I think the, the general principle of trying to be very mindful of a smooth, steady flow of patients uh, you know, prior to pandemic, that really meant to have a constant number across the days of the week. Probably now in the catch-up phase, it means a constant slope, so that that slope is very gradual and upward every day or every week. Great, thanks. I want to bring our uh, discussants into this conversation as well. So let's go first to you, David Hoyt. What questions would you have for our uh, panelists, Bruce, Schaff, and Tom? David, are you, yeah. are you uh, muted? Great. I'd like to ask um, our panelists what how, how they're communicating with patients during this very difficult time. So Schaff, I can uh, start with that. Uh, I, it, uh, obviously, patients were very anxious, and, and what we did, uh, again, in surgery was uh, give the surgeons guidance. Uh, we have telehealth systems and uh, that are used for, you know, Canada is a big country like the U.S., and long-distance patients, we often do uh, consults and visits by telehealth, but it's not a large number. So we, we asked the surgeons to change their ambulatory uh, activity immediately to all virtual visits unless absolutely necessary to bring the patient to the hospital. So um, it was telephone visits. The 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 um, the uh, provincial telehealth network got quickly overwhelmed because they weren't uh, completely set up for the volume that would come suddenly. So they took a few days to catch up. So most of it was by telephone. The very important thing was we told the patients, and they understood, they watched the news, but told them that we're deferring their surgery for 14 days, and in 14 days or less, we will get back to them and let them know if they have a surgery date or if there's any further delay so that they aren't left hanging and phoning back again and again, that we committed to be in touch with them and got our administrative assistants to log that and plan the callbacks. Right. Great. And Bruce, what are you what are you all doing? 
Yeah, I think basically the same. I think David points out very importantly that that uh, the patients definitely need reassurance, and uh, we've done that through a network of nurse practitioners that work with our uh, surgeons and guidance that we've provided to the surgeons' offices. Uh, we have had uh, a generally positive response uh, because the reticence of patients to move forward with anything resembling elective surgery under these circumstances. For the patients who have malignancies and other uh, uh, concerning conditions, uh, we have provided them with an, an overview of how this does not adversely affect their uh, uh, treatment schedules and or uh, their prognosis. In the event that it, it, it might adversely affect their prognosis, we have been moving forward with those surgeries. So uh, we've had generally very good acceptance of it. I think that uh, we probably need to be very cognizant of the fact that these contacts need to be repetitive. Uh, rather than uh, every uh, month or so, they need to be more frequent. And uh, we certainly have uh, uh, been committed to doing that. Great. And Eugene. One, one other. Uh, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to add one other follow up question to, to both of them. Um, and that is as somebody comes forward after a delay, um, is there anything that changes in our informed consent procedure that um, based on the risk of them contracting uh, COVID and how that might complicate their operation or if they've had it and recovered and they now are undergoing an elective operation, do we have to say anything to them about their increased risk? I mean, uh, clearly we don't know a lot about it, but how would you all handle that? Well, this is uh, Bruce. I. I uh... I agree that that's a that's a discussion that needs to be had. I'm not exactly certain how you uh, specify it in the uh, consent, other than to acknowledge that both sides have considered that and have uh, come to the conclusion that surgery is uh, indicated. Uh, the difficulty, of course, is that that uh, in patients who were uh, negative and then contract uh, COVID after uh, their surgery based on very limited reports from China, it certainly appears that the, uh, the risk is greater. And I think that that, uh, that may need to be disclosed to patients until there's more definitive uh, data. So I want to, uh, we'll take a question from Eugene in a moment, but first I wanna to go to a, a question that came in from our one of our listeners, who's referring to the situation of being in smaller hospitals with very few emergent cases, if uh, patients are adequately screened and test tested, have self-isolated, don't have any symptoms, is there any reason not to be operating at this point on healthier patients who aren't going to need uh, access to the ICU or recovery in a skilled nursing facility who have symptomatic pathology but are stable, they've got bad hernias, gallbladders, renal stones, et cetera, any reason not to do some of those less urgent elective cases. Love to get your opinions on that, uh, Bruce and Shaw. Bruce, what do you think? Well, you know, at first glance, I think it's it's rational, assuming that the resources in that hospital uh, can accommodate it. Uh, we have all seen a few unfortunate cases where people come in with symptoms of gallstones and they're reassured that it will resolve. And at least two occasions in our hospital, they represented with gangrenous gallbladders. So um, these are very real needs in these patients. And I think that uh, if social isolation has been complete, if the patient is asymptomatic or better yet tested a negative, that uh, should be uh, considered. And Shaf, what what's your sense? Well, I, I think it, it speaks to two issues. One is the patient consent and the uh, issue of communication between uh, hospitals or medical centers. I think in patient consent issues, uh, if you're talking about operating in a, a community where uh, COVID could be present, and, uh, and I think we're making the decision that the surgery is important or urgent and should go ahead. So purely elective surgery like is going on in some places, cosmetic and other things I think is wrong, is it shouldn't be done. Uh, it does use PPEs no matter what 
kind of surgery you're doing. And, and it also doesn't, uh, you know, can, um, give a consistent message of social distancing and, and what we all need to do as a, as a society. So I think, you know, in terms of when is it okay to open for less urgent surgery, I think that could be done across the board. Uh, that, that for now, um, slow down on everything and then centers that can do the less urgent sur surgery in less hot areas can open up as the uh, more intense surgical centers open up for their activity. Great, thank you. Eugene, let's go to you for a question. Uh, we are listening today from two very different delivery systems, centralized in Canada and not centralized in the US. So my question is, Bruce, to you, whether you think what they do in Canada as being centralized system, they were forced for the lack of the better word to be efficient. Do you think what they are doing could be emulated, adapted in the United States, given that our delivery system is different? Well, I think that there are elements of it for certain that could be implemented in the United States uh, with particular interest in the comments that Tom and Schaff made about uh, smoothing variability to maximize utilization of uh, important resources. Uh, I do think that the uh, U.S. system could uh, very much profit from that. Uh, you know, we, historically, we've had great variability. Uh, in our operating rooms, Friday afternoon predictably is is less crowded than than Monday, and uh, Saturday is, is used uh, somewhat sparingly with a reduced schedule. So I think that we could uh, learn a lot from uh, that reduction in variability. And historically, our our approach to this, most American hospitals, and I'm sure in Canada as well, have been extremely busy over the last several years. And uh, our, our reaction to that has been uh, investing in, in new space and expanding the facilities. And I think uh, this has taught us, and certainly for the next several years with our capital needs, we sort of run out of money in a sense. And, and uh, continuing to build uh, supernumerary operating rooms and spaces it doesn't make nearly as much sense as maximizing the utility of the space we have here. So in direct answer, I do think that uh, America uh, and American uh, medical centers are ready for this. I think that there is a higher sense of uh, social recognition on the part of uh, physicians, many more of whom are working in somewhat aligned and or employed models uh, with medical centers and would be more inclined to uh, cooperate. Great, thanks Bruce. So, uh, and I guess uh, Shaf and Tom, just a quick question for you. Are, have you, you, you obviously did so much work in advance of the pandemic around smoothing and, uh, and, and categorizing of surgeries. Is there anything you're gonna keep in place that you adopted during the pandemic after the pandemic? Or do you think that the system that you adopted prior to this is going to see you through the future? I yeah, think one, one of the one of the things we'd we'd like to keep <clears throat> we would like to keep is the idea being that um, with the uh, emergency surgery before we got involved with Eugene and the Institute for Healthcare Optimization we had a four categories A B C and D and what we learned from that work was that that uh, four different strata was not really granular enough to allow us the precision needed. And similarly, for elective surgery, we have these priority one, two, three, and four systems, um, but the vascular surgery system is slightly different than the general surgery system is slightly different than the cancer system. So I think one of the concepts that hopefully will uh, be per preserved following the COVID pandemic is the idea that those various systems need to actually align. So that within a specialty, we can agree that the certain category of patients needs to be operated within two weeks or four weeks or three months or whatever, <clears throat> but aligning those systems so that everyone is talking the same kind of language and then we can easily titrate up or down the resources available. And I think this will be helpful in managing 
surges that may come for other reasons as well. And it's not just pandemic, but it could be major, you know, traumatic uh, uh, episodes may put a very much shorter term stress on the system. But any of these category systems will help you to plan your, your recovery from that. And of course, there's also the possibility that we will see another wave of COVID outbreak next year, and you'll have this in place for that as well. So I want to take another question that came in from a listener. Have any of you found the predictive models for the COVID pandemic to be helpful in terms of planning and timing your various operational changes? Bruce, what would you say to that? Well, we certainly uh, have been doing a lot of uh, looking at, at the national and local predictive models, as well as an in-house, uh, very uh, sophisticated model that one of our uh, group has put together. Uh, they uh, are somewhat problematic in that, that obviously, that there, there is great variability around it. One of the, the least variable uh, tends to be the, quote, peak uh, assessment. And uh, although the magnitude of the peak varies uh, depending on the assumptions. So the, 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 the summary is that we have been paying attention to it. Uh, we uh, have some difficulty <laughs> trusting it, uh, but uh, it has been exceptionally accurate as we've looked back on the uh, median uh, predictive numbers over the last uh, several weeks. Let's take uh, from, another. From, Go ahead, Tom. Susan, Go ahead. Could, could I answer that? So, um, in our case, I think the the predictive models have been a little bit less uh, helpful, and um, you know, many of the predictive models, I think, uh, as a broad statement, have have overestimated, and I think that's been helpful uh, to to get the right type of uh, social distancing and other societal measures um, acted upon. And as those measures take effect, then of course, by definition, they make the model inaccurate because they, they work better than we think. But on the other hand, from a day-to-day -day planning and, and can we do a little bit more surgery, it, it certainly has encouraged us all to be very, very cautious. And so what we're doing now is we're plotting on a daily basis the actual according to the model. And in our province, as well as in our hospital, the utilization of ICU beds is not following an exponential curve, but by plotting both the linear model and an exponential model, you can easily see when the actual starts to fall away from the exponential model and that that sort of tells you when the you know when the the, the pandemic modeling may be less accurate and, and may be um, in need of downward revision um, all of the all of the modelers have been you know issuing subsequent downward revisions I think is fair to say so so getting an early indicator of when that may happen, it, it becomes very clear when you're two or three days in a row falling farther and farther away from an exponential model, I think is helpful. I think your comments, Tom, underscore that old truism that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And uh, in some respects, th those models have been useful, uh, as you said. So let's go to a question that involves, uh, again, Canada, which is, is it likely that uh, Ontario is going to consider outpatient or ambulatory surgeries as Alberta has done for certain types of low-risk patients? Tom or Schaff, do you want to take that? Um, Schaff, it, it's very, for sure. In fact, uh, that's part of our recovery planning, that the ambulatory surgery centers can step up in their activity and, and offload some of the larger centers with activity that could be done in the ambulatory centers. There are already uh, a fair number of ambulatory centers. And the principle of the recovery is uh, each surgical center should do more of what they usually do. So don't ask centers to do stuff that they don't usually do, but in their core competence, uh, provide them with the resources to do more for the catch up. 
And I think this will be very important for the less urgent uh, patients or benign disease patients that still need their surgery. But uh, we can free up the space in the tertiary hospitals for the high-end oncology, cardiac, and transplant type activity. And I guess this is a related question, and I'd like to hear Shaf and Tom talk about it, but then ask Bruce uh, to address it as well. As as these various changes are taking place and recovery is beginning to happen in different places, what kind of communication and collaboration is going on among hospitals and health systems at various levels? First of all, what's that happening? How is that happening in Canada? And then Bruce, I'd like you to discuss how it's happening, uh, if at all, in, in California. So what, what Tom has outlined is what we're doing at University Health Network, which is one health system and one leadership with one CEO. Uh, so uh, what we're doing for surgery within the context of our institution. I sit on a provincial uh, advisory board uh, panel, which has representation uh, from various specialties like oncology, cardiac, transplant, and other, and from throughout the province leaders. Uh, and, and what we're doing there is trying to harmonize uh, both um, what is um, being done now and uh, what um, the recovery plan will look like in terms of will we allocate cases to different hospitals like the ambulatory hospitals to do what what they can. So I think that communication is getting better. On the way down, the communication wasn't so good because there were some hospitals in the greater Toronto area that just continued doing standard elective cardiac surgery. And now their ICUs are full. And when they got their COVID cases, they're looking to transfer them out because they have no beds. So uh, it, it's not a perfect system. And that's one of the things we could have done better is, is uh, somehow uh, encourage more of the behavior towards, uh, you know, the greater good. Bruce, what's the situation in Los Angeles and for that matter, Southern California in general? Well, I think the Los Angeles uh, County uh, did a very good job of uh, keeping people on the same page. And we did not have the problem that was just described with some hospitals not stopping elective surgery. Everyone did, and everyone uh, was uh, very coordinated. When the county also recommended that uh, hospitals increase their intensive care and bed capacity, we've all come up with plans, and they were all uh, uh, put into place. Uh, some have not been completely executed because the peak was not nearly uh, what we had uh, anticipated at worst uh, scenario. Uh, but what's been interesting to me, honestly, is the horizontal communication at every level uh, in uh, our medical system. That is, the, the CEOs and uh, CFOs uh, from all the hospitals communicate to a very large extent. The CMOs have been in nearly daily communication of the major hospitals in Los Angeles. And of course, the physicians have been talking to their colleagues in the ICUs and in other specialties around the country. And there's been this uh, great uh, sort of folklore type uh, self-education that's gone on about the uh, different ways of treating these patients, including some of the innovative respiratory management of the people in the ICU. And uh, in particular, and David's well aware of this, uh, the SAGES group has done a terrific job of communicating various risks at different kinds of highly specific types of laparoscopy and thoracoscopy and the uh, specific uh, risk of aerosolization of virus uh, during those procedures. So there's been uh, great cooperation. Southern California operates, as you can imagine, as multiple city states. Uh, we really don't have much interaction on a daily basis with uh, either Northern California or uh, San Diego, uh, but the individual population centers are large enough at 20 million or so that uh, they, they, they function uh, as a, almost a state. And that kind of co uh, cooperation and consultation that you describe in LA is that the kind of thing that will might persist post a pandemic? 
Well, I think candidly, we've always had uh, fairly good relationships around here. Um, I, I certainly hope it will. I think that you know, of the whatever silver lining is in this cloud, uh, the degree of cooperation and understanding what we're capable of doing, both as a medical sort of societal organization, as well as uh, individual caregivers, has been somewhat reassuring. Great. So, David, I think you've got another question. Please, uh, please pose that one. Sure. Um, one of the problems that we're currently seeing is the increase in unemployment. And with that, uh, a lot of people are going to lose insurance. So I wonder what people think the impact of trying to offer elective surgery to those patients that are sort of caught in this uh, problem area. Chris, uh, obviously a very different situation. Yeah. thing because in Canada they would be covered and they'd get their surgery no matter what. Right. This is uh, unique to the U.S. Bruce, what's happening in those situations? Well, uh, you know, it's certainly uh, a very real possibility, and yet the magnitude of it is unclear. And also, whatever federal uh, rescue efforts may be applied, particularly in the Medicare population, are unclear. Uh, having said that, um, we uh, we are committed to taking care of our patients. Cedar Sinai provides more uh, uncompensated or undercompensated care than any private hospital in Los Angeles. Historically, we've been able to balance that care against our other uh, margins uh, for uh, insured patients. Uh, we will have to continue to see uh, how that balance works out, Dave and. And I and I I do know that uh, from our CEO on down that we have uh, committed to continue to care for the patients in our community, uh, irrespective of insurance status, and we'll deal with the consequences. Yeah, and we're pushing very hard at the federal level to get that problem recognized and create bridge funding or some kind of funding to uh, deal with that problem as well. So Eugene, let's go to you for one uh, final question. Yeah, uh, it's not, not a quick answer probably. Uh, the most challenging in my opinion situation is now with transplants. It, it is a problem even before the pandemic now, how do you have the organs whom you choose to be uh, have a transplant surgery first, et cetera. Could you please, Chef and Bruce, uh, quickly tell us about that? Um, we're, we're one of the largest uh, transplant programs in North America, and that was a big challenge for us. And again, uh, very early on, we uh, knew that donors weren't being tested or couldn't be tested, and we suspended doing uh, uh, transplants other than very urgent uh, livers that were, were um, patients in danger of dying right away. A little bit further into the epidemic, we um, suspended doing kidneys and pancreas, and we did a, a couple of lungs uh, for patients that were imminently um, dying on the list. We implemented more rigorous testing for lungs, uh, with including a BAL and a negative NP swab and a CT scan. And um, there was a lot of discussion about that in the US in, in terms of when that was implemented and when it could be done. Um, now, as the curve is flattening, we're looking at can we slowly reintroduce uh, kidney transplants because that's a, a type of transplant of relatively lower intensity. And if we get into trouble with resources, we can dial it back again fairly easily. But we have to balance the fact that our transplant patients are missing an opportunity that may never come back if they don't get the organ. Bruce, what's, well, what's I would, Yeah, I would very much agree with that general approach. We did virtually stop our kidney and pancreas transplants and only uh, acute uh, liver failure and uh, uh, high risk uh, cardiac patients who would not survive without a device or a transplant. One of the, uh, in addition to the uncertainty of the organ relative to its COVID status has been the fact that uh, people have been uh, less likely to have the traumatic incidents that lead to donorship. 
And uh, that's sort of potentially good for, for the people that avoid those kind of injuries, but is uh, uh, also slowing down uh, transplantation in, in our country. Uh, Shav, has that been the case in Canada as well? Yes, uh, I mean, donors have gone down a, a little bit. Uh, and so uh, for, for all those reasons, uh, I also think that in the early times, in the heat of, of the uh, COVID, one of the issues was not having transplant teams go together in cars and planes and not go in and out of hospitals and become vectors of uh, transfer of COVID. So that was another consideration in the early time. Well, we have reached the end of our time here, and I want to say a special word of thanks to our speakers, Bruce Gewertz from Cedar sinai Shaf Keshavji from University Health Network in Toronto, and Tom Waddell also from University Health Network, as well as our two discussants, David Hoyt from the American College of Surgeons and Eugene Litvak from the Institute for Healthcare Optimization for a really important uh, discussion today. Please join us for our next PCORI webinar uh, that will occur next Tuesday on nurse staffing issues. More information about that will be available on the PCORI website, as well as information there about all of our other webinar series and the recordings from our uh, previous discussions. Thank you again to all of those who have joined us for this very important discussion. We wish you a very good day. Goodbye. <laughs>